Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 34 through verse 37. There it is, booby, if you want. And the King James text today reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. There's a sermon right there in those five words. Verse 37, that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day, and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? I want to talk to us for a little while today on the topic when it rains it pours hallelujah when it rains it pours if you bow your heads with me one more time master how we love the songs of zion how we love to be reminded of the many wonderful truths of your word we love to sing of your promises we love to sing of your blessings we love to sing of the truths of this great gospel, the incarnation, the birth of our Lord, the death on the cross, the burial, the resurrection from the dead, the ascension. We love to sing of your soon return for your church. But Lord, while singing is wonderful, the most important part of every gathering of God's people is the preaching. If the message that comes from the pulpit is not truth, if it is not delivered with a divine anointing, if the Spirit of God does not rest upon, ride upon every word which is uttered, 
by the preacher of the gospel, then that word is null and void. It is useless. It will enter our hearing and exit just the moment we leave the building. But Master, today there is a marvelous divine transaction which takes place when the preacher of the gospel submits themselves to you and inquires of you, Lord, that you might anoint them, that you might place your sacred presence upon them and upon the word that they preach. And today, O oh God, I know that I cannot benefit or bless the people of God with the word of God unless that word is anointed. Anoint today the speaker. Anoint today a free hearer. Allow us to receive this word, O oh God, today. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Last week I began to talk. Uh, I talked a good bit about the Holy Ghost baptism. And it's interesting because uh, that was not in my notes. So anything I said in that vein was inspired of the Holy Ghost in the moment. But this week as I was seeking God and desiring direction from Him as to what I should preach, this is the subject matter that the Lord gave me. And I hope and I pray that it will be a blessing and an encouragement and a help to you this afternoon. There's a wonderful old hymn of the church which speaks of the promised showers of blessing. There shall be showers of blessing, it says. Oh, I'll tell you, we used to sing that song when I was a kid, and I've told Tommy, it's amazing how many songs when I was young, I just kind of sat through and didn't much enjoy and didn't very much appreciate. They didn't have a tempo. You know how kids can be. It didn't have a tempo that quite was up to snuff for me or, or the message wasn't quite exciting enough. I preferred I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. I used to love when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But I'm here to tell you today I've grown up. Not only physically have I aged and gotten older and more mature, but spiritually I have as well. And now there are so many of the old hymns that as a kid I did not appreciate. But boy, I'll tell you what, I love them now. Boy, they speak to me now. Now when I hear them, when I sing them, oh, I'm telling you, I'm ready to shout and run the aisles because there is a message in those songs that was lost on me as a child. There shall be showers of blessing is just such a song. The Old Testament prophet Joel spoke of a day when the presence of God would fall upon the earth like rain. This is why we sing, There shall be showers of blessing. In Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18, listen. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. This is speaking now of the apostles and the church at Jerusalem learning of what we just read in our primary text. They learned that Peter had gone into the house of a Roman centurion named Cornelius and preached Jesus. And as Peter preached to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen, the Spirit of God, listen children, fell on them. 
They didn't ask for the Holy Ghost. Not a one of them was seeking the Holy Ghost. Not a one of them was praying for, tarrying for, asking for, looking for, waiting on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And yet, all at once, like a sudden downpour from heaven, the Spirit of God fell on that place. And all the family members and servants of this Roman centurion Cornelius received the gift of the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And this is how the Apostle Peter and those Jews who had come with him, this is how they recognized that these Gentiles had received the gift of the Holy Ghost because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And to this day, that is the evidence that comes with our receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do we know when a child has been born healthy? We hear the cry. How do we know when the born-again conversion, the born-again experience is complete? We hear the child cry, hallelujah. But we do not hear them cry from their intellect. We do not hear them cry from their mind. We hear them cry from their spirit, glory to God. And when God brings new life into your spiritual man, your spiritual man, will begin to worship God. But it will not be a language you're familiar with. And God has arranged it to work this way so that there might be physical, visible evidence for those who have received this gift. Otherwise, how could anyone possibly know you received the Holy Ghost? What, because you say so? How many people run around this world today calling themselves Christians and then acting like the devil? How many evangelical and fundamentalist Christians you know today call themselves Christians and yet they're worshiping at the altar of Donald Trump. How many Christians you know in the world today call themselves <coughs> Christians and yet they celebrate policies like locking children up in prison camps separated from their parents and separated in such a way that to this day they've not been able to reunite them. Oh, but they call themselves Christians. Folks, if God did not provide some means of providing evidence for the receipt of the gift of the Holy Ghost, then uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry that walks into the church, saved or unsaved, genuinely converted or not genuinely converted, would claim to have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Am I not telling the truth? But you see, God has provided a means whereby you can't fake this thing, baby. You say, well, but somebody can fake the tongues, huh? Yeah, they can. And let me tell you, the Word of God said, Our spirit bears witness with God's spirit that we are the sons of God. I'm going to tell you something. Every spirit-filled believer, you let somebody fake it and let every person in the room full of the Holy Ghost, they got the real thing. And if you don't, we know it. 
Because God's spirit bears witness with our spirit. <laughs> if you're part of the family, we know you've got the real thing. If you're not part of the family, if you're just going rah, bah, 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 to try to fool your wife or fool your husband or fool your parents or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, honey, got news for you. There will be no witness of the spirit that you are in fact receiving the Holy Ghost. But God provides a means whereby there is tangible, physical, visible, observable evidence that you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter and the Jews who had gone with him to the house of Cornelius witnessed all of Cornelius' house receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. And now in chapter 11, verses 1 through 18, the apostles and the believers at Jerusalem are learning that the Holy Ghost has been poured out. Salvation has come to the Gentile world as well. Oh my goodness, listen to the rest of this passage. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. They argued with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. You broke the law. You went against the law of Moses and you entered the home of uncircumcised men. I'm going to tell you if there was anybody that the Jews of the Lord's day despised, it was the Romans. And here Peter went into the home of a Roman centurion and ate with them. And boy, the early church, the first members were Jews. And they were not happy to hear this. So they contended with Peter. Verse 4, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which when I had fashioned, fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come, unto the house where I was, sent from Sisera unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompany me, accompanied me. So he points to six men with him as he's telling this story. And he said, these six men accompanied me. And we entered into the man's house and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house 
which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, listen, <laughs> Peter hadn't even got his sermon preached, and the Holy Ghost fell. He said, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, the Jews who had called Peter to ream him, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. There is no more glorious an experience, my friend, than being, listen to me, in the right place at the right time. There is nothing so wonderful as God orchestrating a divine and sovereign act of his will. Cornelius was hungry to know the God of the Israelites. And the God of Israel was ready to open the door of the kingdom of God to the Gentile world. Conditions were perfect for a sovereign act of God. You know, there are many times when we worry and we fret over the timing which God holds in his own hands. We long for something. We pray for something. We want so much to see a miracle, a blessing, a healing, a deliverance, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Whatever it is we are hungry for, we hunger to see it come to pass. And yet while we wait, it seems sometimes like it will never happen. Oh, but then, when the time is right, and conditions are perfect. The Lord orchestrates a composition like music, like a musical composition. He orchestrates, he brings all the pieces together with divine harmony. And that, that composition stuns all who will observe it. And it overwhelms all who will experience it. Hallelujah. You had this Gentile who was hungry for God. Who was struggling and striving the best he knew how. To walk in relationship not with the gods of Rome. But with the singular God of Israel. He was giving alms. He was charitable. He prayed. He fasted. This man seriously was trying to walk according to the faith of the people that his nation had colonized. He lived among them. He must have observed 
their songs he must have heard their preaching their teaching and something in him responded and said you know Rome has dozens of structures and temples erected to various gods these people say there's not but one God the Lord Jehovah hallelujah something in me tells me that they're right and we're wrong oh hallelujah I know they don't like me I know they resent me. I know they probably wish I'd just pack up my family and move back to Rome and leave them well enough alone. I know they would not welcome me openly in their synagogue. And they certainly would not allow me in their temple. But I'm going to do my best to understand this God of theirs. For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For they that come to God must first believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If any human being ever illustrated this point... It is the Gentile Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. He believed in the one God of the Israelites and he earnestly, sincerely sought after that God. And God sent an angel to Cornelius and instructed him to send to Joppa and inquire at this specific home for a man named Peter and he will come and he'll tell you what you need to know so that you and your entire household can be saved. And of course, Cornelius obeyed the instructions of the angel. But more importantly, at the same identical time, Peter is on a rooftop praying. He becomes so engrossed in prayer that he is described as falling into a trance. Of course, if you were to say to a Baptist today or a Methodist or an Episcopalian that you were in prayer and fell into a trance, they would look at you like you had a demon. <laughs> but it is possible to become so engrossed in prayer that you lose yourself in the spirit realm as it were and while Peter was in that state he beheld the vision and I'm not going to go through all of this I've read it to you, but this vision illustrated to him that what the law of Moses defined as unclean was no longer unclean if God had declared it now clean. And for this reason, when he was invited into the home of this Roman centurion, Peter was willing to go. He had had a visitation from the Lord that taught him an important lesson, and he said, okay, I'm being invited. The Spirit informs me that there are men downstairs who want me to go with them, and the Holy Ghost has told me, go with them. Don't worry about anything. Thank God for people who know how to obey the voice of God. Cornelius obeyed the voice of God by sending men to Joppa. And Peter obeyed the voice of God by going with those men back to the home of Cornelius. 
Don't you see how God was putting various pieces together? Don't you see how he was orchestrating something wonderful? And then as Peter comes in to the house of Cornelius, he begins to preach to them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God fell like torrential rains upon that house. Oh my God. There is nothing in this world like being in the right place at the right time. Some of you folks who worry about your deliverance, some of you people who worry about your healing, including myself, some of you people who worry about whether or not or when you're ever going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, let me fill you in on something right now. God has already written the composition. He has already designed the plan and created the conditions that will lead to your receiving the miracle, receiving the healing, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, receiving the deliverance. Whatever it is you need, I've got news for you. God has already designed. He has already planned. He has already put the pieces together. And when the time is right, and when the conditions are perfect, He's going to bring it on together and the Holy Ghost is gonna fall out of heaven like a torrential rain hallelujah and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost you will receive that healing you will receive that miracle you will receive that blessing you will receive that revelation you will receive that deliverance I don't always understand why God does things the way He does it, but it's not ours to understand. Brother Gillum had retired from the Riverside Church of God. He pastored there over 35 years. He started the church. He was there over 35 years. In his 70s, he felt that he was getting old and tired and he feared he wasn't preaching like he used to preach and you know and pastoring is <laughs> a tiring work when you have a congregation full of people i guess i ought to be grateful that i don't have at the moment because in my current situation visiting hospitals and doing nursing home ministry and going to prisons and doing all the things that a pastor does would probably wear me to a frazzle these days. My brother Gillum retired from Riverside. New man came in. A man who had actually come to the Lord and received the Holy Ghost in the altars of that very church under Brother Gillum. Before I started my second Church of God church, I, of course, had moved back to Texas and uh, had found a girl, became engaged to her, and we were attending Riverside, my, my home church in Fort Worth, you know. Well, I'm going to tell you, this young lady started coming to Riverside Church. Her name, if I remember correctly, was, I want to say Crystal. I'm pretty sure it was Crystal. She was kind of a stocky young girl, maybe in her mid to late 20s, somewhere around there. And she'd go down to that altar and she'd pray for the Holy Ghost. She said, oh, I want the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost. 
And Sunday after Sunday, she'd go down and nothing would happen. Every Sunday she'd get up, not having received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And one day, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and I, I leaned over to Stacy, the girl that I was going to soon marry. And I said to her, I said, do you know what the Lord just told me? She said, no, what? Of course, how would she know? I said, he just told me that that little girl is never going to receive the Holy Ghost in this church. I said, he told me she's going to receive the Holy Ghost in our church. Now, I had arranged, I'd found a building in a community outside of Fort Worth where there was no church of God. I'd found a building I had worked it out with the state overseer and we were going to be starting a new work there in a couple of weeks i had pews donated from a larger church that uh, had a little chapel they were renovating and uh, they donated the pew the old pews from there because we had a sanctuary that honestly was a little bit wider than this room we're in now, and the building was probably no longer than this space is, but wider, a little bit wider. So we were picking up and installing the pews and building a little platform and getting everything ready to start having church. And I told Stacy, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God has informed me that she's going to receive the Holy Ghost in our church. Now, I don't proselyte. I have no interest in trying to draw somebody out of one church into my church. If the Lord moves on you, to leave another church and become part of our church, you're certainly welcome. But you're not going to see me running around trying to get people out of other people's churches. I don't operate that way. I'm not interested. I'd rather get somebody that's never known God. I'd rather get somebody that's backslid and away from the church. I'd rather get somebody that has no church affiliation who's looking for a body to worship and serve the Lord with I'm not interested in proselyting so I'm thinking Lord I don't quite understand what you mean she's going to get the Holy Ghost in our church we hadn't even started it yet number one that means in the next Sunday or two she could easily get the Holy Ghost here I don't quite understand long story short Stacy and I we began the church there and a few weeks passed and we married, we had our wedding. And the day that we married was on a Saturday. And that next Sunday I had invited Brother Gillum to come and preach in my little church in my absence. Because obviously we were going to try to do something for a honeymoon, you know. But somehow I told Stacy, I said, you know... I feel like we need to stay close. And uh, I said, I, I, I don't feel comfortable going anywhere today for, you know, for Sunday. I said, I feel like we need to be at the church. I don't know why, but I feel like we do. So we went to the church Sunday morning, and Brother Gillum didn't show up. Something happened. I don't know what happened. So I wound up preaching <laughs> the day after my wedding. I wound up preaching to the folks. We had about, oh, 20 or 30 people at the time. We were just practically brand spanking new when we had 20 or 30 people. Well, Sunday night, I said, well, I don't know what happened to Brother Gillum. I didn't call him or anything. Uh, I'm not sure I had his number available. But anyway, I said, well, we better get there for Sunday night to make sure we can have church and we went Sunday night and sitting in the parking lot was brother and sister Gillum and he said to me we showed up at 9.45 but nobody was here so I figured maybe y'all had canceled church for today 
I said, oh, Brother Gillum, no, there was a miscommunication. Since Stacy and I were not planning on being here today, we simply canceled Sunday school. But we were going to have church at 1045. So he had been there an hour early. But he didn't realize we'd canceled Sunday school. So anyway, so... Uh, so that's why he had, you know, he missed the morning. So anyway, I was thrilled to have the greatest man of God I've ever sat under in my life. One of my favorite spiritual mentors and mentors in ministry. I was so thrilled to have Brother Gillum there. I was so thrilled to be able to host him and have him preach in a church that I was pastoring, I felt so honored, I still do to this day, to have been able to do that. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me as we were driving to church that night, and the Lord said, tonight I'm going to heal somebody, and somebody is going to receive the Holy Ghost. I knew before we ever walked through the door of the church, that God was going to heal somebody and somebody was going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So we went into the church. We had our worship service. We used to have awful good worship services. The Spirit of the Lord really moved in our worship services. We had a wonderful group of people. Brother Gillum got up to preach. And to be honest with you, I never saw Brother Gillum less empowered and less anointed than I did that night. I was so disappointed. See, he had resigned Riverside, retired, and it was like all the wind went out of his sails. You know, his, that man, his whole life was Riverside. And it was as if he just had nothing left to give. He got up in the pulpit and he tried to preach and it was terrible, to be honest. Sister Gillum in her classic fashion, I used to love to watch her. When Brother Gillum was up there preaching, if he was struggling to get under the spout where the glory comes out, if he was struggling to get in the vein, as I like to say, or get in the groove, you know, Sister Gillum, you'd watch her, and she'd be sitting there in her little hand and go up, and she'd start praying, and when she started to get in the spirit, her head would start bobbing like this. <clears throat> and the more she got going, the faster her head got going. So she started out, Brother Gillum's up there struggling, so she's going to pray her husband through. And her hand went up, she began to pray. And then after a while, she's going, after a while, she's going, and after a while, she's going. And she's trying to pray him through. And guess what? Nothing was happening. When he got done preaching, I got in the pulpit, I didn't hardly know what to say because it had been so bad. And I got the mic and I said, folks, I said, all I can tell you is this. On my way to church tonight, the Spirit of the Lord told me that he was going to heal somebody. And somebody tonight was going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When I said those words, listen to me, children. The Spirit of the Lord fell on that building. Just like he did in the house of Cornelius. It fell like rain. All of a sudden, everybody in that congregation jumped up on their feet and lifted their hands and started to worship God. And folks began to shout and dance and get happy. I mean, whoo, if Brother Gillum hadn't preached us happy, I wasn't up there screaming and hollering. All I said was, all I knew is God told me he was going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost and he was going to heal somebody. And the Spirit of the Lord confirmed what I just said by falling in that building. Well, guess what? Little Crystal 
who we had watched go to the altar several times at Riverside seeking the Holy Ghost, she had come to my church that Sunday night. She wanted to hear Brother Gillum preach. She knew that he was the former pastor at Riverside. She had never heard him preach. So she wanted to hear him preach. And that is what brought her to our church that Sunday night. All of a sudden, she come down the altar. She said, I want the Holy Ghost. I laid my hands on her. I said, in the name of Jesus, receive you the Holy Ghost. That girl shot her hands up in the air and literally started dancing and shouting and talking in tongues. Just all over the place. Just shouting. And she started running the house. She was a chubby little thing. She started running the house like somebody set fire to her panties. Talking in tongues the whole way. We're shouting and having church. All of a sudden, the phone rings. Stacy's mother goes and gets the phone, comes into the sanctuary. She said, my mother, her mother, Stacy's grandmother, had cancer and was uh, terminal. She said, my mother's been taken to the hospital. They said that tonight is the night. She will not live past the night. She said, can we please pray for her? And one of my church members was a great, big, heavy, independent, free, holiness, Pentecostal preacher man named Brother Love. That was his, his literal last name, Love. He said, Brother Mara, I feel the Holy Ghost saying that you need to anoint a cloth. If you hadn't got a cloth, just cut a little corner off of your the bottom of your shirt and anointed with oil. And you and that little girl that just received the Holy Ghost, she's dripping with the power of God. You and her pray over that cloth. And then Stacy and Jane need to take that to the hospital and they need to pin it to her mother's gown at the hospital. And God's going to give her a miracle. I said, okay. Sam, I'm going to tell you something, honey. If you think... You're the only person in the church who can hear from God, preacher. There's something wrong with you. That's not how the body of Christ works. I trusted brother love. And even if he's wrong, it wasn't going to hurt nothing. I didn't have any hankies. I didn't have any loose cloth anywhere. So we got a pair of scissors. I pulled my, the, the, my shirt out of my pants and I just cut a little three inch square roughly out of the you know bottom of my shirt we anointed it with oil and I put it in my hand and crystal and I grabbed hold of hands and began to pray and that little girl wow she starts shouting and dancing and I'm trying to hold her hand because we're trying to pray over this prayer cloth she this girl brand new to Pentecost don't know nothing about Pentecost She's shouting all over the place, full of the Holy Ghost, enjoying the presence of God, drunk in the Spirit. We sent that prayer cloth to the hospital with Jane and Stacy. Long story short, God healed her. God healed her grandmother. She came out of that hospital and she lived and lived and lived. God told me, somebody's going to be healed this night. Somebody's going to receive the Holy Ghost this night. And somebody was healed that night. And somebody received the Holy Ghost that night. Because God had divinely orchestrated a sovereign act of His will. Oh, children, I want you to hear me today. This is probably the simplest message that I'm ever going to preach. I want you to hear me. I've got a whole lot more notes, but I've got more notes than I have time. I want you to hear me. There is something about being in a church where there is a move of God. 
there is something about being part of a church where there is a move of God. What do I mean by that? I mean where God regularly is present. Where the Spirit of the Lord is regularly in attendance. Anointing the worship. Anointing the Word of God. Anointing the teaching. Not every church has the move of God, folks. Don't kid yourself. Matter of fact, the vast majority do not. And I'm sad to say, even many Pentecostal churches in our world today are devoid of a move of God. But I'm going to tell you, listen to me now. There are times when God doesn't move in the church. Brother Gillum preached that night. And quite frankly, there was no move of God. There was nothing happening. His words just literally fell to the floor like lead. They, they, just, they, they just had no life in them. But then it rained. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Then the Spirit fell. Oh, bless the Lord. I want to tell you, I know as a child of God, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. When I'm struggling with sickness, when I'm struggling with illness and struggles and troubles I know in my heart I've told Tommy a thousand times I said there is a reason I want a church there is a reason that I hunger for a real church for a church full of people who love God and want to worship the Lord who want to see a move of God who are hungry for a move of God I'll tell you there's a reason why I feel the way I do because I know that when you are somewhere that God can move, listen to me, children, the Spirit can fall. Where God is free to move, the Spirit can fall. Are you hearing me now? If there's no move of God in your church, don't expect the Spirit to fall on that church. It's not likely to happen. But when you have a people who welcome the move of God, Brother Gillum told me many years ago when I was a young preacher, he said, Chuck, don't ever be afraid to get out of God's way. If the Spirit starts moving in a church service and there's no need for you to preach because God is ministering to the people directly. You know, there's no purpose in your preaching at that point because God is already doing something. He said, don't be afraid to just fold up your notes and set them aside and wait till next Sunday to preach that message and just let God do what God is doing. That's why we Pentecostal folks sometimes have good old-fashioned shouting, dancing, running the aisle, church services, because God is moving. God's feeling, filling people with the Holy Ghost. God's touching people. He's healing people. He's having His way. And there's no need for preaching. But then every once in a while, you're in the right place at the right time. And God has already set it up. He's got everything lined up to come together so that that night it's not going to rain. It's going to pour. Hallelujah. That night, just like in the house of Cornelius, the Spirit of God is going to fall like an 
mighty downpour like a torrential rain. And he is going to saturate everybody in the building. You couldn't escape it if you wanted to. And I'm going to tell you what God will do. God will make sure everybody who's looking for something from him is there. And everybody that could care less won't be. Literally. The word of God said in the second chapter of the book of Acts, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. All the people had found this harmonious place in the spirit. They had found a harmony. In other words, they all were hungry for the same thing. They all wanted the same thing. They all longed. Good. The Lord promised if we would wait in Jerusalem, the promise of the Holy Ghost would come. Lord, we're waiting. We're waiting. How we want the promise of the Holy Ghost. And at some point in their ten days of waiting, there may have been a number of people who were there and they were, well, the Lord said the Holy Ghost is going to come, and you know. And they were just there and there. But as the days passed, they grew hungrier and they desired it more. They wanted it more. So that finally, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, all of a sudden, finally, everybody was on the same page. It was the right time. It was the right place. And what happened? And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Amy, honey, one day it's coming. The Spirit's going to fall like rain. And you're going to be in the right place at the right time. And everything you need from God, you're going to get. Adam, the rain is coming. One day, you're going to be in the right place at the right time. And God is going to pour out His Spirit like a torrential rain. And you, my friend, are going to get everything you need from the Lord. Every one of our extended members, I want you to know one of the reasons that I don't appreciate internet ministry as well as I appreciate local ministry is because there is a divine formula for the move of God. It is where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There is a divine formula for answered prayer. Where two or three agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done unto them of our Father which is in heaven. There is a divinely ordained way to do things. And when God's church comes together, every time we come together, I know every time I went to Riverside Church of God, every time I went to any church I've ever pastored, I knew we'd have a move of God. But I never knew when we might see a downpour. Hallelujah. I never knew when, but it would happen. Every once in a while, all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost would just fall. I remember at Riverside, there were services, literally, 
At the beginning of the service, Brother Gillum would come up to the to the pulpit and say, Well, praise the Lord, we're going to start church. And, you know, he was a very country, very kind of a low-key guy. <laughs> He'd start praying. Oh, Father, we thank you, God, for bringing us to the house of the Lord tonight. And, uh, and he'd start praying, and all of a sudden, the Spirit would fall. There was no music working people up into a frenzy. There was nobody in front of the church cheerleading and telling everybody, clap your hands, everybody clap your hands, everybody jump, everybody do this. Everybody, no, no, no. The man was praying. He was opening the service with prayer. And the Spirit of God literally would fall on that place like a torrential, a torrential rain. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost would fall. And I mean to tell you, worship, when the Spirit falls, the first thing you see is this flood of worship. You see the people of God rising up in one singular chorus of worship. And oh, I mean people jump up out of their seats and lift their hands and begin to worship. And you can't stop it. You can't, you can't slow it down. You can't do anything but go with the flow because, honey, you're in a rainstorm. It's beyond your control. It is beyond your control. When the Spirit falls, God literally, literally takes control. When the Spirit fell on the house of Cornelius, God literally simply took control and filled every person in that building with the Holy Ghost. And then Peter, bless his heart, had to explain to them what just happened. <laughs> I want to tell you today, I have a lot more notes, but I'm out of time. I've done it. I'm almost at an hour. I don't want to go any further. Oh, children, when it rains, it pours. When the time is right, when conditions are where they need to be, what they need to be, I promise you today, the Spirit of God is going to fall in your life. You know, one of the reasons a lot of times people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in a church service versus, you know, being at home or what have you. Honestly, it's because the conditions are more conducive to their receiving the Holy Ghost. See, what do you mean by that? Well, you're surrounded by worship. You're surrounded by people worshiping the Lord. At home, you may have kids screaming. You may have people, you know, uh, interrupting you. You may be trying to watch church today and you've got somebody coming up and talking to you while the service, you know what I'm saying? There are all kinds of distractions and all kinds of things going on. And this is why so often people people uh, find it easier to receive their miracle, to receive their healing, to receive their deliverance, to receive the Holy Ghost in the church because it's in the church that everything is focused. You know, we're not, we don't have all these otherwise distractions going on. And it's in the church, my friend, where conditions are ideal for a downpour. Hallelujah. And every time I come to the house of God, when I was pastoring, when I went to Riverside, every single Sunday I'd walk in the door thinking, I wonder if today we're going to see a move of God or if we're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Because there is nothing so wonderful as being part of a downpour from heaven. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. I